Thank you so much for sharing this day with me. I'm extremely grateful that you're here and that you've invited the Safe Surfing Foundation to be a part of this day and bring forth a wealth of information so that we as parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles can remain vigilant in this fight against internet crimes against our children. I have been asked to tell you Amanda's story and I am honored to be able to reach so many people on her behalf. You see, we all have days we remember. It could be the day you were married, it could be the day your child was born, or sadly, it could be the day you lost someone you loved. My day is February 27, 2000. Amanda was only 14 years old. She and I had been to the mall shopping and had a little lunch. Amanda was a great student she cheered, she played soccer. Her friends enjoyed really being around her. But this day she reminded me she had promised one of our neighbors that she would go babysit for them and we'd have to be home by five. Well, at 4.45 that beautiful Sunday afternoon, Amanda started walking up our neighborhood street to sit, to sit for the neighbors. When a man in a truck pulled up beside of her, he opened the truck door and he called her name. When Amanda stopped to see who it was, he grabbed her, pulled her into the truck, and they were gone, just that quick. After a while, I became concerned sitting at home that Amanda hadn't called me to tell me what it, that she was in the house and that everything was okay. So I told my husband I was gonna walk down to the neighbors and, and just check on things. I got to my neighbor's house and she came to the door and she told me that Amanda had never shown up. I said, I, I don't understand, Amanda left 30 minutes ago. She said, I'm sorry, Vicki, Amanda's not here. If you've ever been in the mall or a shopping center or even at a playground with a child and all of a sudden they're out of your sight, you have this instant fear that just seems to swallow you up until you can lay eyes on that child again. Well, that's what happened to me. Fear just started to engulf me and I ran down off their porch and I started stopping children on bicycles, asking them had they seen Amanda. And they all said no. I ran down to our neighborhood playground and I asked other mothers had they seen Amanda and they said no. I knew then that something was terribly wrong. I got back home and I told my husband what had happened and we decided instantly to call in the police. The police arrived just a few minutes later they came in and began asking us questions like, did Amanda have a fight with one of us? Did she want to run away? Was she having a hard time in school? All of our answers were no. Then one of the officers asked me if we had a home computer. You have to understand, this was the year 2000. Not everybody had home computers. And I told him, yes, I had an office downstairs. We took the officers down and they began pouring over computer files. As he did it, his work, he started telling us about how these online predators would get into chat rooms with kids and they would find out information about these kids that led them to find the kids and later abduct them. Sadly, that officer was able to find those files on my computer and began to confirm our worst nightmare. Amanda had been talking to a 14-year-old boy. He said he lived at the beach, he liked to surf and play football. He would tell Amanda his jersey number and she would tell him her soccer number. He would tell her his school colors and she would tell him hers. Little by little we began to see how this predator was able to get information from Amanda without her even asking a question. And then one afternoon he drove four and a half hours to our hometown, came to Amanda's middle school, watched her play soccer, saw her jersey number, and then he followed us home from the game. Now he knew where we lived. On three other occasions, he would come to our neighborhood and he'd watch our house. He knew when my husband and I came and left for work. He knew when Amanda was by herself. He knew when she got on and off the school bus. Now the police knew what they were up against. There were over 40 police officers looking for Amanda that night, along with the Virginia State Police. I remember at 8.15, I was standing in my living room looking out the, the window and it was dark and it started to rain. I thought to myself, she's, she's out there somewhere. She's alone, she's scared, she has no coat, no money, and kids back then didn't have cell phones. I knew if she got away, how, how would she get a hold of us? How would she get home? 
at 9.30 that evening, two police officers came to my home and, and they asked me for something of Amanda's. They told me, they said, Vicki, we're going to bring in the hounds and we're going to start searching the parks and the wooded areas for Amanda. I didn't want my heart to believe what my head was telling me. So I slowly walked down the hall and I went into Amanda's bedroom and there laying on her bed was a pair of her pajamas from the night before. I picked them up then I, I held them in my hands and I said to myself, they think she's dead. And I walked back out in the living room and I handed that officer those pajamas and I looked him right in the eye. And I told him she's out there, she's alone and she's scared, but she's alive. You bring her home to me. Those officers took her pajamas and they left my house. Later that evening I was in a car and we spotted Amanda on the side of the road. I jumped out of the car and I ran to her. I grabbed her and wrapped her in a coat and held on tight. The Virginia State Police gave chase and caught the predator in a cul-de-sac. They made the arrest on the spot. We immediately took Amanda to the hospital. We sat that hospital all night long with a Virginia State Police officer outside of Amanda's bed, um, hospital room. At one point during the evening, the emergency room trauma physician would come out and say, Vicki, Amanda would like you to be with her. We're getting ready to take photographs. They'll use the pictures later in court. I got up to walk down the hall to go to Amanda's room and the doctor put it put her arm on my hand and, and she said, Vicki, when you go in there, you're going to have to be tough. You see, this is one of the most brutal rapes and beatings I've ever witnessed on a child in all my 15 years being an emergency room trauma physician. There were areas so, so shredded that we couldn't even suture her. She's just going to have to heal. I remember touching my hand to hers and I turned around and I walked away. I walked into Amanda's hospital room and she was so small laying in that bed. I remember walking over and touching her forehead and, and moving her hair. And she reached up and she grabbed my arms and she said, Mom, you have to help me. You have to help me teach kids. And I guess she saw that I didn't understand because through pleading eyes that no longer held any childhood innocence or sparkle, she said, Mom, you have to help me teach kids so that what happened to me will never happen to another child again. And I thought to myself, through all of her pain and the trauma that she had been through, she wasn't thinking about herself. She was already thinking about all your kids. She never wanted to what happened to her to happen to another kid again. And that night, holding on to my little girl, I made that promise to her. And it's been 15 years, and we still are teaching children about internet safety. You see, the man that took Amanda was actually a 36-year-old man. He was wealthy, powerful, married, and a father of three little children. Because of his wealth and, and position, in my opinion, he was released on a $50,000 bond to his father, who was a delegate to the state of Virginia, as well as his attorney. He was released before my daughter ever got out of the hospital. By the very next Saturday morning, he would once again be arrested for the rape of another 13-year-old little girl in Williamsburg, Virginia. This time, the courts didn't let him go. Upon investigating his laptop computer that they found in his truck, they found what he called his trophy room. It contained the names and ages of 60 little girls. Yes, I said 60. They were between the ages of 11 and 13. He had road maps that highlighted their, their residence and their schools. He also had a camera with undeveloped film of another child. During the course of the trial, the grand jury would pass down seven grand jury indictments on the Williamsburg case, which equals 44 years in prison and six grand jury indictments on Amanda's case, which equals 43 years in prison. This man could have served 87 years in prison for what he had done to these two little girls. But during the sentencing, the judge would suspend all but 14 years, 
seven on the Williamsburg case, and seven on Amanda's case. It used to be that when I could say that when these girls turned 27 years old, he'd be back on the streets. Well, on January 31st, 2013, this predator was released from prison and is back living in his hometown. And these girls are still suffering. As he was being taken out of the courthouse after sentencing in handcuffs, he turned to my daughter and he yelled at her. He said, when I get out, I'll find you. You're the reason I got caught. And I'm going to kill you and I'm going to kill your mother. Does these comments scare us? Absolutely. Will they keep us from trying to teach children about internet protection and about crimes that could hurt them? Absolutely not. It is Amanda's wish as well as mine that what happened to her will never happen to another child. You see, I'm considered one of the lucky mothers. I was able to get my daughter back alive. I've met families where their stories didn't end so well and other parents that still haven't gotten their children back. But with your help and continued support, these men and women can continue reaching children all across the United States with education that will hopefully keep another child from ever being taken by an online predator. I'm very proud of everything Amanda has done and what she has overcome. But then again, I'm her mom and I love her very much. When I was 14, I met a really nice boy online. He was 14 too. I told him all about myself. Then, I found out he was 37. He knew where I lived. He threatened to hurt my family if I didn't meet with him. He kidnapped me, brutally assaulted, and abused me for hours before dumping me out on the side of the road. I was one of the lucky ones. I survived. I'm Eric Estrada. Join our team and help protect our nation's children. Visit safesurfing.org.